Hey everyone, welcome to Three Beers Deep for May 4th, 2015. This is my weekly Q&A show in which you can go to patrickklopek.tumblr.com and you can submit questions and uh, you can have me think about answering them. Doesn't mean I'm going to answer them, but I'll think about it. And so this is the uh, latest installment in me thinking about maybe answering your questions. So let's get right to them. It's Sunday night. I'm getting ready to watch Game of Thrones. So we're going to get right into your questions. Got some got some whoppers this week too. <clears throat> go ahead and cheers to everyone watching the video version. Mm. High quality Miller Lite. Faded MFC says, hey Patrick, any chance of a what's on my iPhone on three beers deep? All right, let's see. Uh, I will go through the apps on my front. The first page of my phone. Messages, obviously. Maps, Apple Maps. Not for any particular reason. I have Google Maps on the second page. Uh, a photography section that has uh, a bunch of apps within that, like you know the regular camera, Instagram, hyperlapse, and things like that. Uh, the clock, so for alarms. Instapaper, uh, which I use to uh, save long-form text-based articles on the internet so I can read them later on my iPad. Sometimes on my iPhone, but mostly on my iPad. Facebook. Tweetbot, which is a great uh, Twitter app. You have to pay for it, but it... It's fantastic. It's well worth it. Feedly, which allows me to manage my RSS feeds and read the stuff that comes in there. Yes, I still use RSS feeds. Uh, Simple Note, which is a uh, note-taking application that I use to like drag links in for worth reading and to keep track of stories. And it's where I keep some basic information from my YouTube channel. Just notes, things like that that you access on a regular basis. AV, which is like Apple Trailers app, Fandango, the uh, app to set... Uh, things on my DVR. Uh, one of the more useful ones is something called Can I Stream It, which is an app that lets you uh, figure out if a movie you want to watch is available on Netflix or Amazon, and you can kind of check the prices and things like that. Pocket, which allows me to save videos, like much like Instapaper does for articles. Sports has fantasy football and NBA game time and things that let me keep track of uh, things that are happening in the sports world. Apple Watch, which lets me manage the watch. Uh, Kotaku, which is just you know one of those homepage ones so I can check the website. Tumblr, Remote, which is for the Apple uh, TV, because we use that all the time to watch movies and things like that. Uh, Runkeeper, which is what I use to, to run with, although now that there's the activity stuff on the Apple Watch, I might drop that from the front page. 1Password, which is how I manage all my passwords. You should have 1Password or LastPass. Invest in good password software. Uh, Yahoo Weather, great, beautiful uh, weather app that pulls uh, images from Flickr. Uh, in order for uh, it to populate the images of the city that you're looking at. Overcast, which is for uh, my podcast apps. Park Chicago, which is how I can digitally pay to park my car rather than going up to a machine. Uh, Slack, which is how we communicate uh, both at the cards office and uh, with the Kotaku staff. Uh, YouTube, because this is up on YouTube, so I check that stuff. And Taxi, which is like a subgroup that has a bunch of different um, Uber and Lyft and blah, 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 blah. So that's what's on my phone. Next question. Uh, the real Takeshi. Maybe I'm ignorant and missing something really blatant, but I can't figure out why the mainstream games industry takes so few chances on new IP. I mean, movies take years to make millions of dollars and teams of people just like games. And yet, it seems like there's less overall sequelage that goes on, though still a lot. Is this expected to be expected in a maturing and growing industry or something particular to games? I think your question is perhaps slightly off base. Uh, I think if you were to look up the sheer number of comic movies sequels just those alone franchise based films uh there are an uncountable number of them happening in the next couple of years and that number is only growing exponentially as dc decides that they're going to try and do uh, their own shared universe and star wars is coming back and jurassic park is coming back and disney has a billion things and disney owns most of the things i already mentioned uh i don't think hollywood is exempt from this at all i think you just perhaps I think it's possible that films had do a better job of exposing quality, independent, original work uh, in a way that games are not as good at. Um, I think that one of the things we have a huge problem with is on Steam or the App Store or anywhere, just generally speaking, surfacing quality material um, is very difficult. You know, like that's part of my job, right? Is that I hopefully am able to play stuff that you don't have time for to let you know, is this worth your time? Is this worth your money? So. Let's pull aside the Hollywood comparison, but the idea that possibly uh, 
Could games be doing more? Is it weird that games don't have more original games? I don't think so. I think as games become more expensive, it's unsurprising that they're risk averse. Um, but what's amazing is that what's happening in the independent space is that it's become cheaper to produce higher quality, more aesthetically pleasing games. So what's happening is that on the high end, the AAA, there are fewer original games. But on the lower end, where people are leaving to produce original games, uh, those games are getting of a higher and higher quality, both... Uh, well, for a lot of reasons, but aesthetically, they're you know, look at a game like Firewatch, like that. Would not hard to imagine at some point that was like a triple A game, but now it's just an incredible looking uh, game that is possible because the tools and the kinds of people that are producing those games uh, are able to make stuff that is just incredibly impressive looking. Next question, anonymous. During your recent panel, uh, he's referencing uh, one from Northern Iowa. You sat alongside a couple of women who've been extremely critical of your former colleagues at Giant Bomb. During your exchange with questioners in the audience, you seemed to give the impression that you thought Jeff's response to the drama last summer, he's referring to Gamergate, was embarrassing and that the staff had failed people and that it has a diversity problem. Do you still have a relationship with your former colleagues? Is this strained by your negative portrayal of them? I. So... There's a bit of a subtext to this question, I think. The subtext of this question is trying to say that just because I am critical of how things uh, that Giant Palm has handled in the past that I was involved with uh, somehow means I am not friends or close with everyone at that staff, which is wildly uh, inaccurate. Uh, I talk to Brad, Vinny, Alex, uh, probably on a daily basis, I aming them because they are some of my best friends beyond just having been former colleagues of mine. And... Uh, in the panel that this questioner is referring to, I was critical of the delayed response that Giant Bomb had to Gamergate. Uh, the idea being that we waited an extremely long time to respond. There were a lot of reasons for that. Um, but nonetheless, I didn't blame people for being critical of our response because we took a long time to do it and then mostly just said, yep, this stuff is crappy. Is that something we could have done earlier? Probably. Is that something we should have done earlier? I think so. Um, and then in the larger spectrum is the lack of taking things like Gamergate seriously at the time that it first sort of bubbling up. Backpad a little bit. Gamergate, I think, has been around for a very long time. It's just that the name Gamergate has uh, ascribed uh, a better descriptor to a movement that has been around for a very long time. Now it just has a name associated with it. But that would it be true if more sites like Giant Bomb or other sites had women, is it possible, is it likely that they would have taken things like that more seriously because the people involved in those publications would have been affected in a way that the people currently running those publications aren't? It is indisputable that women are treated more aggressively and more uh, hostile on the internet. And it is also true that as far as I know, of any of the major publications, none of them are run by women. There are some senior staff members. That is certainly true, and things have gotten better, and it's always good to uh, acknowledge progress. But were any of the major sites that eventually wrote something about Gamergate run by women, do I think that they would have responded faster? And do I think that it would have been fruitful and helpful if there was more diversity on these various staffs? That's not just Giant Bomb. Uh, the panel I was on, I could only speak to Giant Bomb and also the trends at large. I think it would be different, and I think that would be helpful for everyone involved if there was more diversity in that respect so that you staffs would have a better understanding of not only uh, what the readers are uh, going through, but other authors, but other, just at large. Like, you just have a better sense of, of what's happening. And so I think it isn't... There's nothing wrong with being critical about how you handle something in the past. Part of the talk that I gave there was about making mistakes, owning up to mistakes, being okay with mistakes. And I think part of the subtext of this question that bothers me is saying like that just because I'm critical of how uh, a site I was a part of handled something in the past, something that I was an active agent, something I was involved with, as though that somehow is a bad thing or I'm throwing people under the bus, I think is wildly disproportionate uh, to what I said. It is entirely possible to be wrong, to be critical of your friends, to be critical of your colleagues, all in the pursuit of doing things better. And that is always what I'm after. So interesting question, but also kind of a dick. 
uh 617 sports fan says does e3 excite you anymore absolutely uh i don't there's reasons to be cynical there's always reasons to be cynical uh about everything but the idea that you get around to e3 time and like fall of four might be announced or whatever might be announced like it's an it's a moment where the industry waits to unveil their biggest secrets in the grandest fashion and if you're someone that likes playing video games the idea of learning about the bet the, the great new game, something really exciting, unexpected on the horizon. I don't know how you can't get excited about that. Do I get tired of going? Do I get tired of sort of the, the churn that goes along with E3? Totally. I've been going there since I was 14. So it would be kind of odd if I wasn't a little bit tired of E3 in some fashion. But I still get, even right now talking about it, excited about what might be happening in just over a month from now. And also because Fallout 4 might get announced. And also, if they don't announce Fallout 4, I think people might actually riot. People really want Fallout 4. <laughs> I want Fallout 4. Uh, Anonymous said, Hey, Patrick, it's probably just a tax year thing, but noted several streamers putting out games they have financed or co-developed, as well as some media personalities dropping the microphone and heading for greener development-related positions lately. With the role of commenter and creator merging, do you ever see yourself making a game? And if you would entertain the idea, what would you... What would your game, if you had to, and if you would entertain the idea, what would your game be if you had to write a high pressure 60 second press release style synopsis? Sorry, I didn't mean to stumble over your question there. Uh, I guess I would entertain the idea of making a game that I guess involved me or starred me. Uh, that seems rather presumptuous um, that people would have an interest in that or that that would be a worthwhile endeavor. But certainly it's happening. You know, PewDiePie has a game. Angry Video Game Nerd has a game. Um, so it is a thing. Um, and so I can't say that I wouldn't be interested if it made sense or there was the right opportunity. Um, I guess what kind of game would it be? Hmm. I think it'd be awesome to be some sort of roguelike, you know, looking at Binding of Isaac, Spelunky, something along those lines I think could be uh, a lot of fun. Um, it's interesting to see folks getting into stuff like that. I don't have anything against it necessarily. Like, I don't know why putting out a game is any different than talking about games or, or anything like that. So it's, it's certainly uh, a little bit unexpected. It's not. It's a brand new territory, but I don't think that necessarily makes it a bad thing, quote unquote. Uh, House Rising asks, thoughts on the PC Gamer E3 press conference thing? Not looking for you to hate on another publication or anything, but the idea makes me feel uncomfortable. If the editors aren't involved, even if the editors aren't involved in the sales, they're still crafting the identity of a show through writing and other means. Overall, it feels a little too close for comfort and something that's supposed to be along the lines of Sony's or Microsoft's press conference. Thanks. Uh, I'll agree that it is a little bit odd that a publication is involved in a press conference in some degree. It's one thing to put together a stage show in which you are highlighting games that you're excited about. Um, and maybe that's really just what this is, right? It's just PC Gamer putting together a stage show and kind of calling it a press conference because the PC platform is not an individual entity. It is not Steam. It is not good old games. It is not Microsoft. It is not any company in particular. And so for PC Gamer to put together what they may be promoting as a press conference because that gets them a little more buzz as a result. I'm really not sure it's any different than what IGN or GameSpot or Giant Bomb or anyone does in which they book a bunch of people to show things off and sometimes they're exclusive and sometimes they're premieres. Um, so if they're calling it a press conference, does that make it feel kind of weird? Sure, but ultimately the PC is not a hardware platform in the way the other ones are bankrolled um, and invested in by individual manufacturers like Microsoft, Sony, or Nintendo. So I get where you're coming from, but I don't think it's the same thing. And without knowing how they're handling ads and sales like that, I guess there are. It could be an opportunity where it's a little bit strange. But uh, as it stands, I think I think it's okay. Uh, Anonymous asked, "When are you gonna go drinking with Swery?" Man, I told him, "Hey, you should come to Chicago." He didn't respond to the email, but. You should go read my interview with him on Kotaku. It was really fun. He talked about masturbation because it's where he does what's where he does. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Got to start wrapping up here. Chick Digger 802 interesting name. Two questions. Can you give some quick thoughts about the Fast and Furious uh, series you recently marathoned? Uh, I'm up to – I've watched the first four films and then had to put it on pause – 
because we started bumping up against Age of Ultron. So we rewatched the first Iron Man and Captain America, the first Avenger. But uh, I did really enjoy uh, the bits that I had uh, watched uh, so far. It's a series that kind of goes up and down. I thought Tokyo Drift was uh, better than anyone probably gives it credit for because a lot of people have been telling me, Tokyo Drift is a shitty movie. It turns out Tokyo Drift is amazing. I really enjoyed Tokyo Drift. It's weird. It's kind of an, this maybe a stereotypical caricature of Japanese culture, but I tremendously enjoyed a lot of that film. Uh, and the first four minutes or first 10 minutes of Fast 4 are great, uh, but then the rest of the movie is pretty terrible. But I've heard that Fast 5 is really where it takes off, so I'm excited to finally dig into that now that we are past uh, Age of Ultron, so I don't have to cram in any more Marvel movies, and then hopefully I'll get around to uh, finishing off Fast and Furious uh, really soon. Um, and that's going to do it. That is it for Three Beers Deep. If you'd like to submit questions for the next episode of Three Beers Deep, you can do so at patrickklopek.tumblr.com. If you're watching this on YouTube and you'd like to listen to a podcast version, you can do so by going to uh, inventorymanagement.symbolcast.fm. If you'd like to stream it, download the episodes, or get an RSS feed to plug into your favorite podcast app. Uh, if you're on iTunes, just jump in uh, or type in or dump in inventory management and you will pull up the podcast please uh like it rate it share it let people know it's how we spread the good uh word on uh, all the stuff that i'm doing all the stuff that the community around the stuff i'm doing uh it's always great to talk to you guys uh, i always appreciate it uh, it's very humbling and uh, i will see you guys all next week